So let's talk about transportation. Imagine with me for a moment what our world would be like if our cars did not run on oil. There'd be no smog in our cities. There'd be no wars over oil-rich regions. There'd be no oil spills to clean up. Now imagine further that the replacement we find for gasoline is just as easy to use, automatic to access, and inexpensive to buy. That's a future I believe in. That's what I call honorable transportation. I believe in that future, and I know it's possible. It's already happening now in certain places around the world and around our country, but not yet here, and not yet nearly enough places. I think the missing piece is that we have to remind ourselves of our stake in that vision, our stake in that future. So to explore this today, I invite you to take a walk with me through two tunnels and the transportation systems that travel through them. This is Grand Central Terminal in New York City. And the tunnels that carry the trains in and out of Grand Central are the first stop on our tour. I've always loved Grand Central. My dad is an architect, and he used to commute through Grand Central every day before he retired. My mom would often take my brothers, Pete and Chris and I, to the station in Bronxville, New York, near where we grew up in Yonkers. The three of us would sprint out of the car and get up to the platform, always wanting to be there before his train came around the bend. On afternoons around this time of year, we knew his train was on the way before we even saw it, because the light above the station above us would be lit up by sparks from the third rail. The third rail, of course, is that conduit that carries the high voltage, high current electricity that powers the trains. Two years ago, Grand Central Station celebrated its 100th anniversary. But the tunnels were there first. The tunnels date back quite a bit further. And in the late 1800s and early 1900s, my ancestors were living and working in New York City. My great-grandfather on my mom's side, George Benton Terrell, was a dentist in Manhattan, but he was raising his family in Flushing, Queens. I know that they rode the trains and rode trains through those tunnels back then. But in those days, the trains were very different. In those tunnels, in those years, were running coal-fired steam locomotives. This is an image from the London Underground, which celebrated its 150th anniversary recently, and of course, they also started off on coal. It's hard for us to imagine what these tunnels must have been like, with these trains running through them. Noisy, hot, smoky. It's, it's hard for us to believe in our daily life today what that would have been like. Well, it turns out that the trains were not really as hazardous to the individuals waiting on the platforms as they were to each other. In the early 1900s, an accident happened in New York that caused a transition over to the electricity we know today. In 1902, a White Plains Express, southbound for New York City, entered this Park Avenue tunnel on Manhattan. Because of the really bad air quality in these tunnels at that time, it didn't see the warning signals ahead of it. It didn't know to slow down. And it missed the sight of the new Rochelle local that was right in front of it. They collided, and 15 people were killed right away. Thankfully, New York City around that time changed the law and said that no longer would any coal-fired steam locomotives be allowed in these tunnels. It's interesting to think about a lesson there as we look to today's transition of our automobiles and thinking about transitioning them from gasoline over to maybe electricity or something different. Because while certainly this change away from coal cleaned up their tunnel, quickly fixed the air quality issues, and stopped the train accidents from happening. It also removed a very essential quality that I believe we lack today. It severed the connection that we each have with that energy system that carried us down those rails. That steam locomotive was in your face if you were standing on the platform, literally. You understood the energy that you were using to travel those rails. Today, there's a third rail that sparks above us sometimes, lights up the sky, but its energy comes from somewhere far off, somewhere mysterious. So how are we to know how to make this transition in a positive and proper way as we're thinking about our automobiles? To do that, I invite you to visit our second tunnel, 
Um, and I need a change of perspective to get us there. So this is a picture of the Earth that I think we're all familiar with by now. It was taken by the Apollo 17 spacecraft in December of 1972. It was the first time we were offered an image of our Earth as one whole, one complete, and one discrete planet. I was six months old when this picture was taken, so it's very fair to say I've never known our Earth to be anything less. When you zoom in a little further and see a picture of our Earth taken from the space shuttle, now we can see the atmosphere in a little bit more detail, shining above the Indian Ocean. We can see the depth of it in the height of those clouds, and we can see its thinness in comparison to the Earth and space behind. This is the second tunnel we'll visit on this tour. Now, friends, remind me, this is nothing like a tunnel. This is the atmosphere. This is the opposite of a tunnel. And, of course, that's true on our personal human scale. A tunnel, to us, has a defined beginning, a defined end. It's usually pretty dark and cramped inside when you're in the tunnel. The atmosphere is anything but, right? It's almost limitless. It's open. It's transparent. And yet, on a planetary scale and on the scale of our energy challenges, this is exactly a tunnel. It begins at Earth's surface, and ends out in space. And whether we recognize it in our daily lives or not, nature is telling us that whether the pollution we create from a coal-fired steam locomotive in a train tunnel, or the pollution we create in a power plant at the end of a third rail, that location doesn't matter to the tunnel on this scale. My energy use and the pollution that I create affects everyone that I share this tunnel with. The same goes for all of us here in this country and in other countries. All of our footprints affect each other. So on this scale, let's compare what our transportation system looks like and what our electric system looks like and see if we can get a little bit of guidance. This is the only data I will share today, and I promise not to dwell on it. This gives you a sense of the efficiency, or you can also think of it as productivity, of our transportation system on your left side and our electricity generation system on your right. So let's start with transportation. For every gallon of gas that we burn in our cars, we're able to harness 21%, or about one-fifth of that gallon, to actually turn our wheels. The other four-fifths are lost to heat. In our electricity system, the unit of energy we put in to create electricity we get about a third of that back. We harness one third of that to make electricity. The other two thirds are lost to heat. When you think of this in terms of productivity, these are pretty bad numbers. One fifth is like working one day a week in a five day work week. The 30% is a day and a half. I don't know how many of us would depend on keeping a full time job if we were only showing up a day or a day and a half a week. And yet, we, sat we satisfy ourselves with these low percentages, these low productivities of our energy system every day. This is data from the Department of Energy. These are not my numbers. These are just actual data from last year. How have we come so far in 100 years that we've had progress in our personal electronics and computers, progress in our telecommunications, many of which are now sitting in each of our pockets as we sit at this conference, progress in our medical technology and our medical science, and yet all of that progress has been powered by very inefficient, very outdated electricity. If these numbers look similar to you, it's because they are similar in the process that they use. We are burning fuel to turn wheels, to turn our cars, or to make, make electricity. The wheels that we turn in our power plants spin turbines and make electricity. It's exactly the same process as the steam locomotives in the tunnels that we used to run under New York City. Whether we like it or not, we are still running many, many steam locomotives in our one tunnel. Most of our electricity comes from this. As a chemist working in this field, this frustrates me that we are at this point in 2015 and this is what we have. As a dad and a consumer and a citizen, it infuriates me. It's ridiculous. How can we do better? I know we can do better. 
One example, of course, is renewables. Renewables like solar and wind and hydropower on this scale are 100% productive. There is no energy loss to heat on that scale. But it's not very personal. It doesn't bring it home. Let's talk about our cars for the last minute here. There are cars out there today, like this one, which are fuel cell electric cars, and they give us all the efficiency and low emissions that we want from an electric car, but they do not depend on the electric grid. They do not depend on those steam locomotives in our power plants. This car makes electricity for you right on board. This is the car I want my son Andrew to learn to drive on. This is the car I want he and his cousins and his friends to learn to drive on, and I tell you why, there are two reasons. First, it's because of the way it makes electricity in this much more efficient, much different way. It literally pulls the electricity right out of the fuel that it uses. And second, because of the promise of the kind of fueling station that you can access when you have these cars. This is an on-site hydrogen fueling station. There are several of these, only several, around our country right now. We need more of them. The exciting part about this is that all the hydrogen that this person is using to fill his car and all the hydrogen that 100 other people like them would need to fill their car and run 300 miles on that day is made right there on top of that canopy. It's literally back in your face. And when we want to bring that connection back to us, we want to have it back in our face, of course we will demand it be clean and efficient and quiet. And this is all of those things. That box essentially works like a tree does. It takes electricity energy in, maybe from the sun or from wind. It takes water. It makes oxygen that we breathe. And it makes the fuel for that car and a hundred others like it. Let's think about reconnecting with our energy footprint. Not just because it's clean, but because once we reconnect with it, it allows us to think and to dream and to imagine up a better future for ourselves and those that come after us. Let's choose that path. Let's dream and imagine and dream out loud. Thank you.